guys. Well, today we're going to have a interactive session with Mr. Aaron. And I do have a few questions for him. All right, great. Yes, we can't wait for that. So <laughs> up next, let me now introduce Aaron, okay? our creativity and innovations mentor. He is an associate guru at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business's Master in Entrepreneurship Program. Also a faculty member of Ateneo Center for Continuing Education. He is the author of the book, The Creativity Handbook, A Guide for Future Creatives. And he is the co-founder of CIA Bootleg Manila and the ASEAN Director for Creative Intelligence Associates Tokyo. Let's all welcome Aaron Palileo. Hi, Robbie. Hello, Karen. Welcome to everyone here. Uh, I'm eager and I'm excited to to have our session. I also have a few questions for Karen. Um, <laughs> so yeah, again, let's have a creative and productive morning, everyone. Great, great. Good morning, Karen and A. And yes, what a match we have this morning for this learning session focused on building confidence and creativity. All right, so we'll have creative confidence. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let's start and let's get on with it. So we have in this segment of our program is called 10 questions. Now, why? Well, because you all have 10 questions. But <laughs> since you two are experts on different topics, I'll give you a chance to ask each other questions. So each of you have 10 questions so that we from the audience can learn with you as you pick each other's brain. So of course, Audience, not to worry, you will have a chance to ask your own questions too. You can send your questions at any point during the program. All you have to do is send it to our pigeonhole. As you will, as you will see on your screen, there is a QR code, the left one. Okay, the left one is for our Q&A. Scan it and it will lead you to a portal where you can put your questions. So remember, scan the left QR code that's being shown on your screen right now. That will lead you to our pigeonhole portal and you can put your questions for A and Karen there. Feel free to send it also through our Facebook page in the comment section and also for our Zoom uh, participants you can put it in our chat. So just put it in the chat box and we will, we will get to your questions. We will do our best to answer all your questions. Now, we also have a poll. So that's the QR code that you are seeing on the right side. It contains only one question. So please, we encourage you to answer it and it will be part of our Q&A later on today. All right? Okay, all right, so let's start. And as they say, ladies first, so Karen, your question. Uh, I, for I, 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 I thought Karen would be the one to answer first when you said <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> okay. sorry, sorry, A, we're putting you on the spot first. So, okay. So Karen, your question for, for a -Rod. Okay, good morning, everyone. I, said, I think I said good afternoon earlier. I'm really sorry, it's good morning. <laughs> Hi, good morning, Sir Aaron. I do have a few questions for me. you. <laughs> I'm very interested with your topic, though, and I can't wait to learn myself um, this morning and, of course, our audiences. Okay. Now, my first question for you would be, how would you define creativity? Okay. Um, creativity can be explained in a few ways. Sometimes we talk about uh, products or, or ideas as creative. Sometimes we talk about certain people and define them or describe them as being creative as well. It could be a celebrity, it could be a musician. Uh, sometimes we talk about certain acts that we do as creative. So creativity has those three things. On one hand, it's a product. Um, then the product will not materialize if there's no process that drives it. So the second P of creativity is the creative process. But driving the whole thing would be the creative person. So those are the three facets of creativity, but cutting through those three 
would be the creative mindset. And uh, to me, and this is my definition of creativity, is that creativity is a mindset that favors things that are different. First and foremost, a lot of creatives, a lot of people who are creative, and regardless, regardless of any field, they, they favor things that are not traditional in their field. So first, they favor things that are different, but those things should deliver. They should work. They should make lives better. Third element is that creative, uh, creativity, the creative mindset, favors things that would delight people. So that, that, that would be my description or definition of creativity. A mindset that favors things that are different, things that will deliver, and things that will delight. Oh, and that is just the first question, everyone. <laughs> I've learned so much <laughs> just for the first question. The second one is, how does one try to be more creative? Okay, again, a bit, that's, a, that's a tough question to answer, right? Because mm -hmm. there are so many ways that you can be creative. But um, I think the, the, the base um, and the most fundamental uh, mindset, and I, I feel to be creative, it starts with your mindset, is um, an openness to things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that includes being irreverent to your own traditions, your own successes. Being open to new possibilities, new learnings, new ideas is, for me, um, the, the seed that uh, allows creativity to flourish. Wow. Opening to more ideas. That's great. Yep. And this one. What is the most important thing to remember about creativity? Ah, well, I, I, <laughs> the thing that pops in my head right away is that I think creativity, a lot of people think that um, it is something that you need only in certain things. But I want to, I want, and this is why I, I'm uh, really making creativity as my personal advocacy. Um, one of the things that we should remember is that we can make everything that we do creative um, down to our day-to-day -day chores. Uh, so that's 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 what they call small C creativities. Like the, we're familiar with the big C creativity, the 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 Mona Lisas of this world, right? Um, but down to our day-to-day -day tasks at work, at home, the way we play with our children, the way we approach um, our life, you can be creative. Wow, I, I think it, it's important for us to hear that right now, especially that everyone's just staying in their houses most of the time yes. because it's the pandemic. And I think that question yes. is also connected to the next one. How important is creativity in your work or life? Yeah, well, if you look at those three things, um, if, if you want your life or your work to be productive, and if we're looking at it from a career perspective, right, and we want to succeed, we want to excel, um, that first element of creativity, of being different, allows you to stand out versus competitors, for instance, or um, other people, right? Let's call a spade a spade. You're also competing for attention, maybe, for resources. If, you are, if you're an HR person or if you're in operations, you're competing for attention of the boss. So um, being different will, will definitely allow you to stand out. But... But being different for a different sake, we all know that there are weird people that, 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 that are just weird for weirdness sake, right? It has to make sense. Being different just allows you to stand out. But the second thing is, hey, what are you going to offer me? Um, mm -hmm. But hey, nowadays, more so that we are stuck in the pandemic, the third D is the most important. We need to be delighted. Um, mm. We need emotional gratification. We need, we need joy and happiness in our lives. So, so creativity allows you to do all of those things. Being different and relevant at the same time. Great. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. What yes. I like, I like the way you phrased that. <laughs> what, is, uh, what do you think is the biggest myth about being creative? Um, one is that, uh, you know, um, that it's only for certain people and certain mm -hmm. fields. Um, one of my, one of my, one of the things that I lament, but I also love hearing is, and the, I love hearing it because it's a challenge. When I teach, for instance, finance people or operations people, creativity, and right away they assume, you know what, we're not creative. Mm -hmm. our, our craft, our discipline is not about being creative. So that's sort of the myths because of, you know, other industries are more associated with creativity. So that's one of the biggest myths. Creativity is for, for everyone. 
and and that's also why it's a challenge it's uh, a great interesting challenge because if you unlock those people and and make them realize that hey they are and they can be creative in an applied way and they see the mm-hmm. fruits of that creative mindset bearing in their own fields then then it's a thrill yeah i very much agree with that because i'm from a different field and i understand that creativity is very very vital true true okay, and number six how would you define innovation now let's go to innovation okay so two things that are that are, have a lot of misconceptions they're 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 loosely used they're interchangeably used um creativity and innovation right um, a lot of people, a lot of companies know that we need to innovate. And mm-hmm. it has become a cliche. People just throw it around. Um, mm-hmm. But innovation for me is um, impactful improvement. Uh, you know, you take something that exists. It could be your product. It could be your um, department. And then on a bigger scale, it could be your organization. Mm-hmm. But you, you, you level it up in a way. So you improve on it in a way that creates better impact for your stakeholders both external and internal, right? So it, 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 it is for your customers, but it's also for your own company to, to level up. So the simple, the simple acronym I have there is I-squared um, or, or yeah, mnemonic device. It's impactful mm-hmm. improvement. Um, and, and innovation is a process. So that's actually the, the, the second P of creativity. The creative process, in fact, is innovation. Mm-hmm. So the, the dynamics is that you are going through the innovation process. It's a step-by-step approach, not, not necessarily linear, but it's a process that you follow. But if you don't use the creative mindset, if you don't approach your innovation process from the mindset of creativity, then that impactful improvement may not happen. So those are the two things. Creativity is a mindset. Innovation is a process. Wow. That's something we've learned today. You know, um, it's just something that we need to apply every single day, especially yeah. in our work. Okay. True. What is True. the connection now? I think you've already answered this, but can you elaborate more between the connection of innovation and creativity? Okay. Um, yeah, let me, let's, let's, let's um, use a different uh, world, for instance. Um, mm-hmm. oh, you're, 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 you were a, well, you're a medical physicist, right? And... Mm-hmm. Um, every student, every student goes through uh, a process, right, of learning. So when you were studying to be a physicist, everyone had the same process available to them, right? You're studying, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're doing your exercises, your exams, all of those things. Imagine that's the innovation process. Mm-hmm. But there are certain people, you, you graduated cum laude, right? What was the <laughs> difference between you okay. and the other students? Mm-hmm. It was a mindset that maybe that mindset was that, hey, I'm going to really um, a- approach this process of learning from, from mm-hmm. that perspective of curiosity. I want to learn because I want to help people. I want to learn because I also want to succeed and, and better my future and all of these things. That's the mindset mm-hmm. that drove that learning process. So that's similar to innovation. Anyone can follow the innovation process. You know, you can find objectives, you can ideate, you can screen ideas, and then you can implement. But if you're and, and this is one of my biggest lamentations in, in management. You hear companies saying, our objective is to grow market share, for instance. So that's the, that's the beginning of their quote-unquote innovation process. We want to grow market share. Then let's look at the creative mindset. Is that different? Mm-hmm. Well, everyone says they want to grow market shares. Will it deliver? Well, for you as a company, mm-hmm. but it'll not make your customers' lives better, really. Will it delight? Maybe the, the big boss will be delighted because money will flow in, but not mm-hmm. the customers, right? So if you don't have that mindset that you're going to approach things from, from I'm going to disrupt and I'm going to be non-traditional and all that, then the innovation process would just be futile. Wow. I very much end relate. up like a student, <laughs> a student who just passed, right? Yeah. It's, it's just a student who passed. Pasang awa. Like me. I, sorry. <laughs> I don't kidding. believe that. I don't believe that, sir. <laughs> but that's a very good example. Now, I, I further understand the connection between um, innovation and creativity with, with your very apt example. The good next one. What is now the difference between conversion and divergent thinking? 
Okay, so um, just for the benefit of people out there, convergent and divergent thinking were um, realized by learning psychologists in the 50s. They realized that there are two kinds of thinking. Um, when you say divergent thinking, uh, it already implies you're, you're moving away, you're opening mm -hmm. up. Right. So um, our psychologists, I, no, no, sorry, in my firm, we have psychologists that, that we work with. This is the best explanation that he has for divergent thinking. Imagine you're at the beach and when you're at the beach and you are in that um, relaxed mode, you're not working, you just take in the sights. Everything is interesting. Right. So you are just scanning everything. That's divergent thinking. You're allowing mm -hmm. things to just engulf you. The virgin thinking, he said, is like taking an exam. Suddenly, you're tunnel vision, right? You're taking a math exam and, and you're using algorithms and all of these things to, to make sure that you answer the exam. So your, your, your vision, both uh, physiologically, I don't know, you're the medical physicist here, and emotionally is so oh, limited. So you're, you're micro-focused on things. So divergent thinking is to open up. To, to absorb ideas, to, to consider new opportunities or new concerns, um, to generate ideas. However, mm -hmm. and this is one of the biggest misconceptions of ideation and brainstorming, um, there's convergent thinking that happens. You should close that process so that you can start being deliberate. You start mm -hmm. micro-focusing and being critical which of these ideas are important. That's what convergent thinking is. So you open and you close. Wow. And I think um, I kind of relate to it when you, I saw one of your videos and it was very interesting. It was about an equation in mathematics. You explained something like if it's five plus two, it's equivalent to ah, yeah, seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. That's convergent then, thinking, right? Because yes, there's only one answer. Right. Yeah. And then sometimes when you have the um, summation by seven, you have a lot of combinations to go to seven because you have decimal yes. numbers. So you have infinite yes. combinations to that. Yeah. yeah. Very much. In what, ways, <laughs> in, what ways might, in what ways might we get to seven suddenly? You're opening up the possibilities. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, how to find an inspiration now to start with the innovation process? Okay. Um, in, in the innovation process, inspiration finding is not uh, being inspired by a significant other, huh? it's it's mm -hmm. it's different. So, um, inspiration finding is really if if innovation is impactful improvement, um, then then you should ask who would we um, impact, who who would we create the impact for, or or what would we improve on. So it is the catalyst that 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 moves the process. Um, mm -hmm. Inspiration finding means you're looking at a new innovation objective that will, will drive the process. My favorite uh, example here might not be um, felt as, as, as we used to feel it, but uh, um, because of the pandemic, um, if you ask, um, if you look at EDSA, for instance, right? And mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at the traffic there, the traditional approach is, oh, how can we reduce traffic on EDSA? How can we reduce the cars in EDSA? So, so mm -hmm. that's already a very convergent approach because you're favoring car reduction. But inspiration finding means reframing it, looking at it from a totally different perspective um, mm -hmm. and maybe asking, in what ways might we make the Metro Manila driving experience enjoyable? Suddenly, it's a totally different objective, right? And, and, and you're not just talking about car reduction. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're diverging away from just car reduction and you're making it truly delightful um, mm -hmm. that, that you're hoping that there's a time, hopefully in the near future, that we would go around Metro Manila driving during rush hour, uh, mind you, not yeah. 3 o'clock and there's uh, <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning, but rush hour and you're saying, wow, it's such a delight to move around yeah. Metro Manila. That's an objective, right? We don't know yet what the idea mm -hmm. is, but that's the inspiration that will drive the process. So inspiration finding is really finding a new approach, a new objective rather, a new opportunity. Uh, entrepreneurs call it opportunity seeking. So, so that's what inspiration finding is. Very important, the oh. most important step of the innovation process really. Um, maybe 70% of your time when you're innovating should be spent in, in that stage. Inspiration, yeah. Wow, that's, that's very well explained. And especially a lot of people are just stuck in traffic. <laughs> and they love the yes. example in EDSA. 
Yes, actually, um, yeah, be, that's one tip for everyone when you're stuck on EDSA. Actually, I, I, I designed a course once for, mm-hmm. for one of our programs in Ateneo Graduate School of Business. I designed my course by, by looking at all the billboards on EDSA because uh, I was uh-huh. stuck in traffic. And I was just reassociating, allowing all the billboards on EDSA to trigger an idea in my head as to how I would redesign a course. So wow. use, use, yeah, so use traffic on EDSA as a, a creative uh, platform or a creative mm-hmm. jumping board. Wow, that's uh, another way for us to look at it, especially yes. when we're something yes. <laughs> Okay, for the last one, how do you know your customer's needs? Okay, so um, when this is related to the inspiration findings stage. Mm-hmm. There are many ways to find innovation objectives, but the most powerful is to, to extract it from, from the customers that you have. Whatever customers they may be, it may be an external customer, like a buyer, or it could be an internal customer, like the other department. And um, the uh, traditional approach is to ask them. And, 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 and that's your traditional market research. You're going to ask what are you looking for. But uh, according to psychologists, up to 90, 90 to 95% of our, of our behavior happens to us unconsciously. So we can't rely on people to articulate what they, what they like and what they need. So um, one of the ways, one of the easy ways, our psychologist in, in my firm does this, instead of asking people what they're looking for, he asks them to complain. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, just look on social media. When people praise, it's so short and sweet, right? Hashtag blessed. <laughs> Tapos na. <laughs> but when, when people complain and when people rant, the dreaded more so button long. is there, right? Yeah. And then permission to rant and ang haba. When people complain... Mm-hmm. They're more emotional. They're more specific. They're very detailed. Mm-hmm. So you can extract, you can extract the needs from there. It's not literal. You have to infer it. Um, sometimes you make them. What 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 are psychologists? Uh, so wait, going back. No, what, the questions you ask is first to, to ask people to complain. What is missing? What do you find missing from the existing? Second is annoying. What is annoying? Meaning mm-hmm. it's there but they don't like it. Missing is. It's not there, they want it there. Annoying is it's there, but they don't want it there. Mm-hmm. The third is disappoint- disappointing. It's a great idea. I like that idea, but you're not doing it properly. It's a disappointment. So MAD, what makes people mad, in other words? That's one way to, to extract what people need uh, and what people want. Um, the second way, which is more really, uh, I would say, more complex or more advanced, is you make them remember their most primal, most emotional memories. What is your most favorite memory related to this field? Or what was your worst memory, worst experience related to that particular field? And that would reveal to you, that would reveal to you their deepest needs. Ask them to be specific, their most cherished memory related. And we did this for ice cream, for instance, or for, for, uh, for milk tea, or for yes. clothing. Make them recall their most cherished memories or their most painful ones that would reveal to you their deepest values and needs wow. those are just 10 questions that we have for you to air but i personally learned so much from you even though i'm not in the field i can relate and i can apply it on my own life as well and on my own field thank you my turn. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you. It's your turn now. But before that, you know, there's some okay. <laughs> there there's some things that I well, I was trying to take notes, right? And uh, it, it's very interesting what 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 you've been saying about. I like the term that you have to be irreverent to your uh, yes irreverent. Was that to your comfort zones or to your I know uh, yes yeah. So I I that that is a different way of especially looking. your own successes, Robbie. Yes. Irreverent, the ba- mm-hmm. not only your comfort zones, but your 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 successes really anchor you down sometimes, and they right, right. they uh, prevent you from moving forward. So and and I think that's something that uh, is a different way of looking at um, how we see things and how we how we can do things that we we shouldn't we shouldn't just sit on our laurels or as they say, the mm-hmm. parang uh, okay, na ako, I, I'm I'm doing things right, and that's it. Right? Yeah. But we have to challenge that and and to to question it every day. You know, just to mm-hmm. make sure that we're improving. And uh, I, I just want to add, Robbie, because yeah. you know, like, but that's that's uh, that's I, I just I, 
I'm very particular about these things because sometimes they get misinterpreted, right? Mm. Um, I'm, we're not advocating that, hey, you just throw everything out of, yeah. out of the wind or whatever. Um, the rule of thumb, if you look at 3M or Google, um, they, they, they have carved at least 20 to 30% of their time for these things, for the irreverence, right? So, so we're not saying 100% because sometimes, you know, parang people just say all of these uh, um, nice to hear uh, <laughs> um, lines, but we're not saying 100%. So if you look at Google and uh, 3M, it's roughly around that. 20 to 30% of your time should be about irreverence. Right. And I, I agree, which is why um, the second part of that was really about it's okay to be different. It's okay to challenge that, but yes. it has to make sense, right? And and to me, that's yes. a big. That's the bigger. That's the bigger picture. That yeah, you can be different, but it has to make sense to people. It has to yes. connect with people, and which led me to that impactful improvement. And you know mm -hmm. um, that your difference has to make a difference in other people as well. It has to impact the lives of people in terms of your creativity. You can't just say na, well, like you, mahilig line. tayo. Mahilig tayo to say na, eh, basta ganun. It, it nakawin ko yun, Robby, ah. Your uh, difference has to make, ah, nakawin ko yun. Your difference has to make a difference as well. Diba? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> and, and, I'll and quote you. <laughs> it's, it's something that's, um, you know, that hindi pwede na yung basta. You know, we can't just say, eh, basta ganun. Um, we, we have to be able to make that difference in other people, and uh, mm -hmm. and this is where this is where creativity, innovation, especially now in this time of disruption, where innovation now is, I, I hate to say it, but it, it's really forcing us to develop new things, you know, for mm -hmm. our for our companies, for ourselves, you know, uh, and that's where innovation is pulling us and. And where creativity is is also uh, you know pulling us towards, and it's exciting actually, it's exciting. And thank you so much for, for convergent divergent thinking. That mm -hmm. was, I I really you know that that was so clear that to take in to take in inspiration even from situations where you feel like uh, like, like traffic right? or traffic mm -hmm. or people who are, um, um, you know, cutting in front of you. You just take in all these stimuli, you know, everything that happens and use it to inspire you to do something great or to do something mm -hmm. different. I, I like that. I like that. And uh, thank you. And yes, it's now thank you also. your turn to ask questions <laughs> for Karen. And I'm really excited also to learn uh, a lot from that, yes. how we can merge these two things together and, we have questions from our audience, but we'll feel that on later. So, Aaron, hey, go ahead. Thank you. So, hi, Karen, again. I'm going <laughs> to ask you sir? some questions. <laughs> Just okay. call me A. That's my name. A, okay. Okay, so, um, you know, this is one of my, my interests, how, how different fields intersect. So, my first question is, how did your experience as a medical physicist, which you did ridiculously well, <laughs> How did that help you become, um, or, or your career now, as an image and personality expert? How did that oh, world okay. um, inform Connected. your current world? Yes. yes. Well, to be honest, I started finishing my undergraduate, and then I finished focusing more on my master's because it would lead me to physics. Um, if I would give a, a brief background to our audience, the medical physicist is the one that calculates the radiation doses for cancer patients. So we don't operate, but we kill the tumor cells just using radiation. So that's what I did. Um, it was very technical. So you have to be prepared. I understood that I had an experience being an employee. I am not just a person teaching all these things now and not knowing what it is to be an employee because I understood and being there in that situation helps me to relate to my audiences now and to my clients better. Um, it's not something I just feed you and things that I've learned from books or from courses, but things that I've personally experienced. I understand that when you're working, I, I started with academia and then I focused on the medical field. Your appearance, your behavior, and your communication are very important. No matter what um, field you're in, either you're in business, this all collides together 
and they actually help you whatever image you want to have. So it doesn't matter if you're in a medical field or you're in the marketing or business field, but all these things are very important for you to have the image that you want to portray to people or the image that you want your clients to see in you. And um, that's one thing that I can really say. Uh, it, it connected because I experienced what I'm teaching. Nice. So it's, I don't know, it's um, practicing what you preach and, and, and you know, having, having that... Uh, actual live experience mm -hmm. in, in, in dealing with different people. I'm assuming yes. the kinds of people and the kinds of um, situations that you had to experience both as an mm -hmm. academe and as a medical physicist, not easy, I'm sure. And, and yes. I'm sure your personality and image had to, had to um, be, be there. Now, mm -hmm. speaking of image, uh, we all know that it's very important in, in life and, and more so if you want to succeed. Um, but of course, uh, the pandemic, I'm assuming, um, has robbed us of mm -hmm. the traditional ways that image is built, right? Because um, before, you can, you can talk to someone, they can see your yeah. face. Uh, now, if it's face-to-face, -face, you are masked up. And, and obviously, now you're also either face-to-face um, -face or online. So um, how, can, how, can, how can one establish his or her image considering mm -hmm. these pandemic limitations? Nobody saw that the pandemic will come in 2020. Everyone was, um, you know, everyone just never expected this to come and the whole world just ceased. And, but it's important for us to think that even though that happened, you have to persevere, you have to continue. There are ways for you to do it. You know, before, during trainings like this, um, a lot of trainers were not open doing online sessions because we understand the difference of doing it personally. You know, it's different when you talk to someone personally, the nonverbal communication, you would see in that person and how you would um, show it in you as well. It's different when you talk, it's different the way you dress. That's why we understood that now in this pandemic, we added another in the foundations of image, not just your A, B, and Cs, mm -hmm. but also your D. That is your digital presence. Because I know that um, companies do tons of meetings every single day. And you need to understand how to help yourself and to still make your image intact, even though it's just an online presence. And like this, I can give an example. Um, people, when we're in person, you do eye contact with someone. But when you're in a Zoom meeting or in other types of meeting, you don't look at your screen because once I look at you now, you don't look at the camera. So it's, it feels like in your audience, yes. you're not looking yes. at them. So those are basic examples. And your lighting, it's important for you to always have the right light or else they won't see you, uh, they won't see you um, clearly. And then you need to have the right um, device for your audio because sometimes if it's too low, you tend to shout. And then they would think, oh, maybe this person is, is mad or yeah. um, I, I can't hear them clearly, things like this. And of course, the way you share yourself on your social media, it has to direct your businesses now. You know, other people feel that oh, I'm not too techy or I'm not very much into computers, but you really have to adapt because there's no other way for us to do it now. Um, there are so many risks when you go out. And I can personally say it because I had COVID last year, last September, oh. but it was not because I kept on going out. It was something um, I've experienced and then my whole family had it. But you don't want to risk that to happen to you because there's so many people experiencing that outside and having complications and you're going to put your life at risk. So either you're not going to adapt or you're going to adapt now. So if I were you, I'm going to study more about digital presence and what it is to make an impact, even though it's just for you. I'm assuming and I'm hoping that you're much, much better now. Uh, yes. <laughs> that you recovered uh, 100%. Um, mm -hmm. But I like that point, though. Uh, I never realized that. I've done, I think, close to or over 100 webinars already. And mm -hmm. I never realized what you said, that our tendency is to look um, at the person that we're talking to. And that compromises looking at the camera yes. itself. Uh, and now I'm conscious about that. <laughs> so, But I, I, I like that, what you said, that... Um, we need to really be very particular about how our digital presence is and, and the mm -hmm. traditional um, 
I guess interpretation of digital presence is you have a social media account. But yes. you're right. Like how you facilitate your Zoom meetings and all of these things. That's digital presence. Mm-hmm. These points. Thank you. Um, okay, now I, I'm, I'm going to um, connect this to brands because I'm also mm-hmm. a brand um, consultant. And, you know, with, with brands, you talk about this, the identity and the image gap, right? Mm-hmm. So brands want or feel or think that they have this particular identity, that this is my personality, that this is who I am, only to find out that the customer's image of them mm-hmm. is, totally, is totally different. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, simply put, maybe they're thinking of themselves as a young brand, and then they, the customers, the images, oh, you know what, you're, you're, you're boring, you're old, uh, as a brand and all that. I'm sure it happens to people as well. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it happens to people as well. They think that they are of a certain identity, a certain yeah. way, only to find out, or maybe, yeah, only to find out their friends or their peers don't share the same. So their image and identity don't match. What should they do mm-hmm. to address that? Oh, matter? that's actually true. Um, with businesses, ideally, your brand should be in alignment with your image, but that doesn't yes. happen all the time. And most of the time, it's not aligned. So what you really have to do is to understand that when you put on your image, your appearance, your behavior, and communication should be aligned as well. And especially for brands, um, it's important to look at it like another angle. Um, You mentioned earlier about um, with your customers, sometimes they give complaints. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, It's important for you to have an open heart and to have Mm -hmm. um, an open ear for constructive criticism. And sometimes it comes to the point of being in a form of complaint from your customers. Sometimes you see Mm -hmm. it in your perspective, in your point of view, but you also have to see it in another point of view, and that is your customers. So how do do they perceive you? You have to be open to that because they're seeing something misaligned with your brand and your image, and you have to be open to that. And one thing that I really, really um, understand and um, the importance of being founded in your behavior, because behavior, this is where your etiquette comes in, your civility, and a lot of brands have their code of their core values or their code of ethics, but they don't really follow it. They're just there yes. because um, it, it's part of being compliant, you know, uh, it's it's written there, but your, your, your employees and yourself, sometimes you don't follow it. And once you read your code of ethics, it really helps you build relationships with your employees. It helps you build relationships mm-hmm. with your clients and becomes better. Um, I really focus more on the behavior because sometimes even though you, you do great things in your job, but you don't have the right values and virtues to show to them, it means nothing. So you have to go back to the basics and what are the foundations and you have to be um, connected with the people. You brainstorm it again, you be open, you evaluate, and then you make a change. You know, change is never easy, but um, change right. is an important thing for you to help become better your brand and your image. I hope I said that right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, you know, you're 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 so correct there. It's really walking the talk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know, like having having a mission statement and your core values. Anyone can do that in a one day workshop. Mm-hmm. Um, but but really. Uh, applying it and living it more so when 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 it's most difficult, I guess. But it's really walking the talk, yes. um, and I guess that's also true for people. <laughs> you have to be consistent Definitely. with what you say and what you do. <laughs> yeah. Now this is a two-part question. Um, you know, this is again one of one of the biggest cliches. What? Why are first impression? Why is first? Why is your first impression important? Wow, Why yes. are first impressions important? It's, important. I, you know, it's a cliche, but I wanna, I wanna, I wanna <laughs> hear it from uh, an expert, right? Because everyone uh-huh. just says it. So uh-huh. why is it really important? Actually, it's true. You know, because first impressions happen when another person encounters another person. Either you're speaking or you're not speaking. And when it comes to your clothes, sometimes another person you don't personally encounter them, like talking to them. But your clothes, a lot of people don't know. It's a part of a nonverbal communication. So whatever you wear, you're sharing a message to people what you're wearing. Perhaps they did not encounter you, but they saw you from a distance. And they know that that is your Mm -hmm. position in your company. So what happens is that first impression happens in different kinds of encounters. And an observer makes a behavioral judgment on the wearers or the person that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. First impressions are important because you cannot change that anymore. 
that's the first mm. thing. It only happens once. It only happens once. And there is what we call as the halo effect. The halo mm. effect is like a static first impression that can be a lasting or unchanging impression regardless of future encounters. And you do not want to risk that. It can be good, it can be bad, but you never want to be in the bad side of it, especially if you want to impress people like your boss. You never want to um, put it at risk that they would look at you and your first impression is not good. And it's sometimes, no, it's very important with job interviews. People in the mm -hmm. HR would look at you, um, like they would make obs uh, observations of you. Are you late? What kind of, or what clothes are you wearing? Is it a different interview? Uh, is your nails colored? Uh, is your shoe polished? Those are simple things that sometimes we don't put so much attention, but it has a huge impact, especially when you're already in a in a big setting. How do people perceive you? That's, that's very important. It's not just applicable in your business, but even in your personal life. How do people see you? How do people perceive you? So you have to remember that no matter where you go, no matter uh, what position in your company you have, you need to always in, um, think about the image that you show to people, what kind of image you portray to them, because it's important that whatever you feel and you see yourself, other people should see that in you. It should not be in contrast to each other. Nice. So this is my second, the second part of my question. So what if you made a bad impression? But the saying mm -hmm. is there's no second chance for first impressions. Yeah. So what if you already made a bad impression? What's, how do you recover from that? Yeah. It happens, and I'm sure it happened to you, so it happened to me, yeah. even before different people. It happens. But you need to learn from that mistake for you not to repeat that in a future encounter with someone else. But sometimes mm -hmm. when people um, misjudge you at first, because perhaps it was uh, your fault at some point, you need to really persevere to prove yourself that that is not how they saw you in the first time. Um, sometimes, like I said earlier, the halo effect can be a lasting or unchanging impression. It can be. There's a possibility that they will never change the way they look at you. But there is a huge possibility that people would change the way they look at you as well. They say first impression lasts. Sometimes it doesn't. Because when they see that um, you're... The way you continue your path and the way you prove yourself is much more the way they saw you. It really proves that the way or the first impression about you is wrong because um, it's a continuous process that you have to prove yourself to people, mm -hmm. to show to them that you're worthy of the job. Every single day you wake up, you're, you're on time, you're not late, and you're prepared when you have to be there. When your boss asks you about something, you already researched because you did that last night. So it changes the way they look at you because in the process, they see more about you. So don't be defined and be stuck and not moving forward because this is how they see you. You have to change that so it won't happen again. But if you have to continually progress to show to them that this is not how they saw you at first because it happened. I had bad impressions with people, but they were the ones who told me that, hey, that is not how I saw you now. This is not how I see you now because the way I perceived you before was this. And then the way they see you now, it's a bit different or it's completely yeah. different because you already proved yourself and you show that you're not the person that they saw first. That, that, that's how my college friends and college batchmates, that's what they say to me when they see me now. Wow. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I mean, how you're teaching? Anyway, um, but but you know what I what I I realized there, um, the same goes for when you made a good first impression. You exactly. still have to follow through on that. Yeah. You still have to follow through on that, right? You have to deliver on that uh, uh, the promise that your first mm -hmm. impression uh, made. No? Um, how can how can, uh, uh, well, uh, we, this was already asked earlier, and I asked this already, mm -hmm. um, but I know you're also um, very particular about health, and, and yes. I, all, I also watch your, your Pocket Mentor series. Yours is dynamic, no? I'm uh, mm -hmm. uh, insecure. Ako dun. Mine has no, uh, I don't change my costume. Um, oh. I, I didn't change into workout clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I like the way that your your series um, changed Thank not you, only <laughs> in terms of content, but visually, mm -hmm. and suddenly mm -hmm. there's movement and everything. So I like that. Um, now, so and, and that's when I realized that you are also very particular about health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, health is so is so difficult. 
um, very important today, right? And we all know, we all know, again, another cliche, we all know that we need to be healthier. But for someone, for someone who finds it overwhelming, right? For someone who finds it overwhelming, what is that gateway uh, process or practice? What should they Mm -hmm. first do? The thing that they should do, we know that if you need to change someone uh, drastically, just make them do it in baby steps. What's that first step for someone? For me, the first steps or the first step is commitment. Because no matter what steps I give you, no matter what uh, diet plans I give you, if you're not committed, you will never do it and you will not be consistent. I understood the importance of this because I worked in the medical field. I mm-hmm. saw what it is to be on the other side of the spectrum. You, know, you do not want to experience that just for you to change the way you see things and just for you to change the way your lifestyle is because it's really hard. Those people would want to add more years in their life, but they don't have a choice anymore. And you have to learn from their mistakes. You, have, you don't want to learn the hard way. It's really hard. Um, in, my, in my field, there were patients that I saw this day and the next day they're gone. You know, it, it, it's the reality of life. And sometimes we take things for granted, like eating right and healthy. Oh, we already know that, but we don't take it to heart because it hasn't happened to us yet. So when I worked in the hospital, I understood that working out is not just for you to have a great shape. It's a bonus for you to have a great shape because you will have the discipline. But the first thing you need to understand is being committed. Why are you committed? You need to, you need to answer those things. First thing is you have to be committed to eating right and working out. Now, why are you committed? Because you want to have a good quality of life. And you do that every single day. Um, it's important for you to do that because you just don't, you know, sometimes when a person or an athlete prepares for um, his competition, when that person is very much uh, persevere, uh, persevering in his path, you tend to really uh, focus and practice for months and months for your competition. But I believe an athlete that really pursues um, health is a person who just did not focus on the competition, but really loves sports and really loves fitness. Because what happens is that other athletes who are completely finished in their competitions, you would see now they have so many vices and they gain so much weight. There are people who do that. But you can see the difference of a person who's committed because they understood why they were committed in the first place and not just for the sake of a competition. They understand that it's for a better quality of life and everything, the trophy, uh, your perseverance, it's just an additional bonus for you when you you are in shape. But the important thing is you understand why are you committed to fitness and to eating right. Nice. I, I, when, when you were talking about it, I... I instantly thought of uh, certain athletes that that ballooned after they a- after their careers were over. So good thing that you you also pointed that out, right? It was a totally different driver, I guess. For some of them, it was really winning and the accolades. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't so much the quality of life. Um, I know you're also very equally um, particular and passionate about the environment, mm-hmm. and such another big big. Uh, um, topic altogether, and same question. If if it's such an overwhelming thing, right? Uh, when when we look at what's happening, the news, climate change, all of these things. Mm. So if you want to make sense out of it and you want to contribute in your own little way, what should be that first step? Wow, you know, I understand that when um, a person really sees all these views, the first thing a person does is to point fingers at other people. And that should not be. When, when I was asked that question, 2017, I was asked, what is the biggest problem in this world? I did not focus on the effect. I focused on the cost. And I was a part of the cost because I know that humans are the reason why there is climate change. And you need to understand the science of it, but it really concludes to one answer. You know, it's because of human activity. And you're a part of it. You can never say... It's because of the people that do not believe in climate change. No, you're a part of it. So I am also a part of the problem. So more than you saying those things to other people, you have to do this and you keep on pointing fingers to other people. The best way for you to do is to show them that you're doing it. That's going to be the best advice. Compared to just you saying it and you're not doing it, the best thing that you can show to people is to show them that you're actually doing it. 
And there are simple ways for you to uh, live and start a green lifestyle. I started doing that as simple as that. This March, uh, we have an event called this Earth Hour. It's a global event. And simply mm -hmm. conserving your energy, turning off your appliances when you're not using it, as simple as that. Especially now that people are staying more in their houses, their bills rocketed because everyone is consuming more energy. But if you would understand where this energy is coming from, in the Philippines, we focus more on using fossil fuel. And when you burn them, you emit so much carbon to the atmosphere that is very much concluded or it results to an addition of the effects of climate change. So more than focusing on the effect, you have to focus on the cost and you're a part of it. So rather than pointing fingers to other people, you have to start showing to them that you want to start your green list. That's what I do. Nice. Um... So many, so many uh, good points to to dwell on uh, from from those two last answers. My final question, though, um, now that you are a pocket mentor, now that you're a mentor, how can one be a great mentee? Oh wow! Uh, I understand that mm -hmm. the mentees cannot just learn from the mentor. A mentor can learn from the mentees as well. It should not be yes. one-sided relationship. It has to be two. Yeah. You have to build rapport, you have to build relationship, and you have to build trust. On the side of the mentee, so don't look at your mentor with, um, with so much doubt or you feel that she or he is not trying to say the right things. You have to build the right rapport and trust. You have to have an open mind and an open heart to what he or she is teaching. Because at the same time, your mentor can learn so much from you. We don't know everything. We just focus on one field. That's why we need other people to help build um, our knowledge about many things. So don't try to um, doubt everything that they're saying, but try to build relationships and have the right foundation when you start it. It's always going to be a two-way relationship. It should never be one. Nice. Well, that's it for me. Thanks, Karen. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, it, was a, it was a great set of answers, diverse and short, uh, succinct, but, but uh, ripe with knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Thank you, A, for the questions. You know, I, I, have, I took down notes as well, but I want to give time now for our, our viewers for their questions. And sisingit ko na lang yung mga, you know, what I got also from your, from your talk, Karen. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I had a question that you eventually answered anyway, so okay na rin. <laughs> but let me go to some of the questions that we have uh, from people who are watching us on Facebook Live and, um, and also on um, uh, here in Zoom, right? Uh, but before that, a shout out to Westmead International School. Uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, hello to everyone uh, who are, and you're tuned in live uh, in our Facebook page. Thank you for watching. Um, okay, the first question I think here uh, goes to A. So A, sometimes we, we tend to overthink things that it stops us from creativity. So that's, a, that's one of their challenges. So how do, you, um, how do you stop that? How do you like, you know, like you're weighing too many options. You're always saying oh, yes. what's okay or not okay. So what, what do you do? Okay. Um, I think it starts with having a, a clear objective um, on one hand. Because sometimes when you are confused as to is this good versus the other, etc. Then there's no clear objective, and I've seen that um, in 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 different contexts. It happens to 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 even high level executives. They can decide, and and the reason for that is that there's no um, overarching philosophy or objective or criteria to guide them. So suddenly everything seems of equal importance. Everything looks like a shiny object. So first, you have to have a clear um, philosophy. So if it's a brand, right, it should be your brand values. And this is what Karen was implying, that you're, you know, you have to, these should not just be empty platitudes. They should be used in an organization. So if you say, for instance, this is our mission, um, so on and so forth, then that should allow you to break these deadlocks to allow you to move forward. 
if you don't have one, well, first of all, you need to have one, right? Every organization, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, needs to have a, a guiding philosophy. Now, if you don't have one, then those three Ds of creativity can, can, can be used. Which of these ideas are truly different? Which of these ideas will truly deliver? And those two, you can, you can quantify. I mean, organizations have to quantify. When I say deliver, you can quantify that in terms of revenues, in terms of expenses being, bought, being uh, bring, brought down, or the number of problems that it's uh, solving. So that's one. You have to have a set of criteria. Second, you really have to know that divergent thinking needs to end at one point or another. Otherwise, you will never, you know, it's, it's your, I call it yung, yung you know, kwentong barbero, di ba? Kwentuhan lang kayo ng kwentuhan. This is your Saturday night, uh, hanging out with the boys and everything is, ang ganda-ganda ng ideas nyo, di ba? Wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Oh, if I were leading this, it's like that. You need to end the process. There has to be a concerted effort to say, you know what? Let's end it at this stage. Let's start converging by hook or by crook. No, so so you you trust though that you have a lot of ideas because you went through the process, so that by the time you converge, you can really rest assured that your converging ideas that came from a good process. So those two, like start that. with clear objectives, but you know what? Uh, towards the end, you really have to close. Ayana, from from the beach, you start uh, uh, focusing like it's a math problem. Yeah, I like that, and and the merging of that convergent and divergent thinking—that's that's something that's important. I think a lot of people yes. um, uh, forget that that when they say, "Oh, yes. brainstorming tayo," na it's limitless. Um, yes. Yeah, there has to come a point wherein you say, "No, I mean, let's let's stop this. We have enough ideas. Let's now do. Let's focus. You know, and have that focus thinking." Um, you mentioned Quentin Barbero. Imagine na miss ko na yung Kwento ko sa pero eh. <laughs> Joke lang po. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, A, for, for that answer. I also have a question now for, for Karen. Uh, so they say that there is a very thin line between confidence and arrogance. So how do you ensure that your confidence does not come off as arrogance? Oh, that's a very apt question because... I know that whoever asked that have seen someone who looks confident, but not really. It, it, it looks so much of arrogance. Mm -hmm. There's actually a difference between confidence and arrogance. Confidence is you're not insecure. An arrogant person is quite insecure, who kept on just comparing his and her goals to another person who brags about everything. That is not what confidence is. Confidence is someone you understand that you don't know everything, but you're willing to learn. But... Then again, you would just accept your flaws and you learn to develop them in the process. You make your strengths better on you, but you have an open heart to learning and becoming better or helping your weaknesses to become your strength as well. You don't compare yourself to another person. An arrogant person sometimes, you know, when you walk in the room, you want all people to look at you. And that is not what confidence is. Confidence is when you walk in that room, you know you're... You're, you're not perfect, but that's okay. You don't want other people to look at you, but you know how to carry yourself properly. Even though um, you have insecurities, you put it behind you, you know how to overcome it and every single day. You help yourself to be better. You help yourself to have lesser rooms for you to develop because you continually develop every single day. An arrogant person is the one who just, you know, feels like they know everything, but you don't. You will never know everything in this world. You just have to maximize the time. Um, every single day for you to know from other people and to um, do your part as well, to evaluate yourself, to know what is not good about you and to be open to people in helping them, um, in helping, in, in talking to them to help you become better as well, not just focusing on yourself. So con arrogance sometimes focuses, on, no, arrogance always focuses on themselves, but confidence is helping other people see um, you, but at the same time, helping them in the process. I like that. That um, a confident person recognizes their own weaknesses and their own strengths, yeah. and they know how to leverage and and work with other people. Whereas arrogant people just think that I'm perfect, right? I'm good. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, thank, thank you so much. Great. That, that's, that's so insightful. I have, a, I have a question here that I believe both of you can answer. Um, and I'd like to hear from both of you in terms of this question. And the question is, is that um, in terms of brand, right? Whether it's your own personal brand or the corporation's brand. So that it should be aligned with the image that you represent in that brand, right? Mm -hmm. So as a person, and this I think is for Karen, really, you, you now, aren't you losing your own identity just by becoming, you know, part of a brand? And in the same, in the same tune as a brand, when, you're, when you are now uh, catering to your clients, right? How do you not lose your identity as a corporation? Mm -hmm. you know, inter how do you now merge the two? So, so as a person, in your, if you're in a corporation, you want to live the corporate values, but how do you now uh, not lose yourself in the process? And as a corporation, how do you not lose yourself as a brand um, out there in the market, you know, just mm -hmm. to cater to other people? So um, sorry, A, I'll, ladies first. So <laughs> Aaron, go ahead. Okay, I would always go back to the importance of behavior. And you know, uh, one of the most um, profound terms that we use in etiquette, it's called civility. Civility is being, um, behaving, not just for the sake of you treating others with courtesy, respect and honor, but being courteous, respectful and honorable in the process. So when you understand that portion, you don't just simply comply because your code of ethics tells you to do it. But most of the time, people don't even read the code of ethics or even do the code of ethics. But if you're a person who understands so much of your value and your character, it just reflects and it just combines and it becomes cohesive with, with the core values of your company. Um, I'm sure companies won't have any um, bad core values. They would always have good core values in the process. And you need to understand their mission, their vision, and to really put to heart. And you should simply live it out. Sometimes you feel that you get burned out. Um, but more than the company itself or you reading all the code of ethics, maybe you have to change more of yourself. And you start with that and everything will just follow through. It's a sim I'm just going to put it as simple as that because I've seen it happen. I've experienced it myself. Sometimes I get burned out. But more than it, um, focusing more on the company, I would focus more on myself. And I have to change things. Um, but I'm not saying that there is nothing bad about what's happening in your company. There are things that you really have to focus on. But more than you pointing fingers to other people, you have to focus first on yourself. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, a? Uh, okay, so first, you know, there's a saying, we can't be everything to everyone. Um, so trying to, trying to do that, trying to be everything to everyone, you end up nothing to all of them because uh, you're going to compromise, right? So first, let me phrase, frame it in that, uh, that way. When, when I talk, my definition of brands no, um, is that brands have three things. A great brand is very specific as to the people that it serves, so that's the first. They really deliberately choose a set of people that these are my customers. To that person or to that set of people, the brand promises a set of benefits. This is my promise to you from the functional level down to the emotional. The third element of a brand, though, is that, and this is what makes great brands great, is that they do those things in their own personality. Great brands are like humans. They're like people. So a, people, a, a set of people that they serve, they promise to that set of people a set of benefits, and they do that in their own personality. So my, I always say this also to the entrepreneurs that we mentor. Choose customers that you can, um, that you love, or at the least you can stand being with for a long time. So you have to find the harmony there that I am, my brand, my company, I've already chosen a set of people that I love, that I that resonate with me because, hey, you will have to be with them for the long haul. So, so that's the first. Um, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, great brands have great haters too. Um, look at all the top brands in the world, whether it's Apple, Nike, whatever, Starbucks. 
There are people who bash those brands, which means to say that those great brands have chosen who to serve and they're perfectly fine with antagonizing others. Because if you don't choose someone to serve, then you will compromise. Diba? You will compromise because you'll say, oh, you know what? This person wanted this, that person wanted that. In the end, you end up with vanilla. So, so you choose. So that's, for, that's why you said, first of all, there's nothing wrong with choosing. Now choose people, customers that resonate with you, that connect with your company. So this is, this is the, the um, sometimes easier for entrepreneurial-driven uh, organizations because there are people who really drive the organization. So that's my, my suggestion there, that um, you, you make sure that your brand, um, the set of people that you chose, the personality also that you define your brand as, already reflect both your own and your customers. All right, great. I, I like that. Um, so it's not really losing yourself. And I like that you said you don't cater to everyone. You know, yeah. that's something that um, I think if you have a brand, you really need to focus on who your market really is. Um, it's yes. not ours to please everyone. And I think that goes also for everybody in terms of your own personality. You're not out to please everyone. Um, just to be yourself and to, to um, you know, live your own values, to walk the talk, as you was mentioned a while ago. And that goes for companies as well in, in that. And I think that's, that's really great. Um, okay, we only have time for maybe two more questions. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start with this uh, first question for Karen, then let's end with a question for A. Um, so Karen... Uh, what is the best way of nurturing a person with very low self-esteem and to nurture that person into a confident person? Mm. Everybody experienced that. I personally experienced that myself. Um, I didn't know how to speak in a crowd. I was so afraid of being on stage. I could not even speak in straight English. I would always buckle up. And a lot of people know that in the Philippines, English is not our first language. So you're afraid to be rejected if you say something wrong. But you got to open up to that person. It's okay not to be perfect because you yourself are not perfect. You need to let them see that you're a person who do not only have strengths, but you have weaknesses. But you cater to your weaknesses to help it become better on you. Um, no one will ever be perfect in this world. No matter how much you see them, they will have um, a weak spot and you need to be there. You have to learn how to build relationships with the people around you, especially with your workplace or the people that you work with. It's not just about the goals that you achieve in life. It's about building relationships to help them become better and not just, you know, stepping on other people to achieve what you want, but helping them along the process and sharing to them, you know, open up your life. Um, what are the things that help you to become better? You're not just there professionally, but you're also helping them personally. And usually, um, if we really help someone personally, um, you open up your heart, you open up your life, and it really helps you to understand the values um, for you to be confident as well. Um, I will always go back to what I said. You will never achieve the level of perfection you always want. You will always have rooms for development, and you got to show that to other people as well. You show them the steps, you be open, um, and you share it to them. Um, being confident is an everyday process. And um, it's, it's choice. It's actually a choice for you to do that, for you to become better and help yourself. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you for all the insights that you, that you gave us uh, today. Um, and uh, wow, it was uh, really powerful. I, I love that, how we're able to bridge the gap there between creativity and and confidence, right? That, you know, somehow in a creative way, we can reinvent ourselves every day, you know? And that's, 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 really, that's really great for everyone to know. Um, and I'm also speaking maybe to people who have been in corporate for a long time or who are, um, you know, um, uh, like myself, you know, <laughs> approaching <laughs> uh, our later years, right? We have to reinvent ourselves to make ourselves relevant, uh, not just to ourselves, but to other people as well. Um, so, A, last question. This is for you. And this is a challenge that people have. And, um, you know, in the complacency and in the inertia, the comfort that people experience, you know, the comfort zones that they have, um, 
what should what should people do during times that you know you need to be creative right i need to be creative and i need to fulfill my task but my creativity just won't work because you know you got into the rhythm of things you're so used to doing things a same way so so how do you spark like that part of the brain how do you how you how do you shut off first that part of the brain that desi- decides to be lazy and then spark the creative side you know how do you how do you work through that i think the the way to do that is that you have to find um a passion a personal interest a personal hobby that you can that you can play around with mm-hmm. um again let's not look at creativity in a vacuum uh you can inflect creativity uh, all across your your personal and professional endeavors um in in ateneo college um in my class on creativity i ask the students to choose a personal field of interest uh it could be it could be a hobby it could be their course for some and these are my favorite uh, cho- choices it could be a personal affliction or a personal concern and then i ask them to apply the creative process throughout the sem so that they come up with ideas related to their personal uh, fields um doing so makes it real to them in in ways that are exciting because it's about them it's about their interests um towards the end of the sem depending on depending also on the tenor of the the sem um if it's face to face or if i have a longer sem i ask them as their final paper to choose um their favorite creative practitioner who is your favorite creative practitioner regardless of field and then i want you to study this person and from that person's practices outputs you have to create your own framework of creativity so both both are about bringing creativity down to their personal dnas right um and and i if if you still don't get inspiration uh from that it's already about your passion it's already about your interest then uh <laughs> i don't know what would right so so it's really about bringing creativity down to your personal dna and and seeing that hey um you know what it's really about me i can practice it it's uh, of interest and i'm i'm able to produce something of of great worth uh it could be for other people but at this point it could be for your own delightfulness too then i'm hoping that would spark the momentum that they can see see and realize hey i can now practice this at work i can practice this in my day to day tasks and all of those things so make it about you first connect it with a personal passion your if it's if it's cooking if it's uh, playing basketball if it's gaming apply creativity there All right, Galing. Um I, I like that that uh, it has to go down to your DNA, you know? The, the the really deep. And if it it still doesn't spark creativity then maybe it wasn't your real passion. Maybe you're not being true to yourself. Oh, that's true. Right? That's true. If you yeah, were yeah, yeah, true yeah. to yourself and you you know, you have to And that might be the realization there. Yeah, yeah. It might and be the... itself is a is is something that can spark more creativity now. Okay, great. So what am I passionate about? Galing. I've seen that from my students huh? they and some of them really oh. admit to the at the end and those are my favorite reflections they uh, I will never forget that one student in college just said I just realized I don't have anything that I am truly passionate about yet and wow. I need to work on that That's nice at least so at, right I nice. mean yeah uh, to to realize that at an early age is I feel uh, a powerful um moment for that student right Okay, so thank you so much, A. Uh, thank you, Karen and A, for for being here today. Uh, we're looking forward, you know, to um, to the videos that you have there in Pocket Mentor. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll I'll um, I'll, I'll give you some uh, uh, details on how you can access these videos from Karen and A uh, on the Pocket Mentor website. And uh, but that's all the time we have today. Okay, and uh, thank you again so much. Uh, I hope you learned a lot from our mentors because I did, you know, I did. Um, and there's still so much more that we can learn from from Karen and A, and so much more that we can learn from our other mentors on Pocket Mentor. And um, I hope you all had a wonderful time. But before we say goodbye, there is someone from Pocket Mentor who would like to say hello 
and say a few words. So here with us is no less than the mentor of mentors, Francis Kong. My good, my goodness. I mean, that's an over-exaggerated introduction. And I'd like to say, hello, Tito Robbie. How are you? <laughs> We're reporting from yeah. Mandaluyong. <laughs> and you know, uh, this is, of course, Rachel, my daughter, who is now my boss. And I work for her. And she's merciless with me. And, uh, you know, I used to say, I'm so happy and honored to share the same stage with these speakers. But now I'm so happy to say that I'm so honored to be sharing the same screen with these esteemed speakers. And uh, I learned so much. I mean, there's, there's just so much that we have to learn. And uh, the situation right now is that as, as far as uh, Karen is concerned, she talks to us about uh, creating an impression, developing your personality. And these are, not just, uh, these are not just fluff. These are not just icings. But if, you, but if I was listening carefully, there's so much uh, substance and material to the character person that uh, sets the image and the, and the person should match correctly. And that's what, uh, that's what businesses are. If there's a mismatch between the communications and the actual execution of the business, then it's not going to work. And then I learned so much from, from A. Uh, a, a uh, this I, I love, I, I love the uh, divergence and the convergence thing. And your work now is so extremely important, sp specifically at this current time, because the pandemic has made a lot of business people realize that our people are not just mere tools to perform a task. As Gary Hamill would aptly say, our people have brains. They have to be used as sources of innovative ideas and creativity as well. And this is the time when many of my clientele now are saying, Grabe, kailangan pala, every person should develop an entrepreneurial mindset in the way they approach business because we have uncertainties all over. And the mind of an entrepreneur looks for opportunities, manages the resources correctly, and that is also the reason why I wish every person in organizations would get access to be able to get information like from A and from Karen. Because I know Pocket Mentor is extremely strict as we filter the people whom we are featuring. And, and one thing I have learned also is that the pandemic has really caused the whole world into a reset. Even in the area of training, my very... The, the, the people that I love so much, the HR practitioners, know that this pandemic has really, pardon the expression, but the pandemic has really made us distinguish carefully between what is craft and what is CRAP. So I can't mention that correctly. Beep. So well, what I mean is we really, we really have to get our best information and education from the people who are practitioners and the people who are not just theorists and the people who have the experience and the wisdom and the maturity to be able to do so. So keep up your good work. Uh, a and Karen, continue doing what Thank you're you. doing and uh, you're just helping a lot of Thank people. And before we end, I just want to say hello to the people in the chat box. Um, for all of our clients who attended today, uh, thank you for giving us your time. And if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to send it over to us and my team will, will um, help cater to the questions or maybe if the questions are difficult, we'll ask Tito Rob to do it for us. <laughs> and then um, for the relevant questions specifically for Karen and Aaron, we'll send them, send them over to them. And then no, pag mahirap yung question kay Tito Robi lagi. Kay, kay Tito Robi yes. ang mahihirap. <laughs> correct, correct. Yes, okay. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So yun na yung official title ko in Pocket Mentor. Look for Tito Robi. <laughs> yes, even he calls him Tito Robi. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, uh, Francis for Francis Kong. Thank you for being here with us also. And thank you for all your insights as well. I mean, you know, it, it's it's so it's so humbling also to to know 
that a uh, person like like Francis Kong still says that he learned a lot. You know, I mean, and I have learned personally, I've been in uh, in one of his seminars and I learned a lot from from uh, from Francis Kong and he he's such a powerful speaker. Um, so so guys, pocket mentor, he's there. Okay, so if you want to learn as well from the Francis Kong, he's there. Okay, and you have that opportunity in Pocket Mentor. So if you want to know more about Pocket Mentor, our subscription plans and packages, the mentors and their content, or you want a tour of our platform, please, please email us at hello at pocketmentorph.com. That's hello at pocketmentorph.com. Or send us a message in our Facebook page or our Instagram account. Or you can visit our web website at www.pocketmentorph.com. That's www.pocketmentorph.com. And we will be in touch with you. So imagine with just the price of your usual entertainment platforms like Netflix or Amazon Prime, you get the chance to learn from top business leaders and industry mentors like Francis Kong, Karen Ibasco, Aaron Palileo, and many more. There are many more uh, mentors that you will find in Pocket Mentor. So once again, thank you for being with us this morning. We hope we have inspired you and have made your day more fulfilled. Have a great day and stay safe.